Okay. <clears throat> um, maybe, the, you know, one of the topics that came up recently in our chat room there uh, when, when this whole discussion was happening about myopia control and vision therapy and orthokeratology and how they blend, um, there was some talk about dynamic retinoscopy. And mm -hmm. I, I think it's a poorly understood um, technique. Could you maybe talk a little bit about what, what it is, how to do it, and what it tells you? Sure. So the idea behind any of the dynamic retinoscopies, and there's more than one type that can be done, is that you are trying to look at how the system is telling you when it's in the best balance and, of course, if there's, for example, a lag of accommodation. But in some cases, it's also just being able to look at when you're getting that patient to engage with you. So when I working, for example, with special needs children. You know, sometimes you try different lenses and you just find there's a lens where the uh, retinoscopic reflex is the brightest and they're clearly much more engaged with not only the instrument, but with the world when you prescribe that particular lens. And so uh, you can choose to do MEM, you can choose to do um, stress, what's called stress point retinoscopy, uh, stress point response. You know, there are different kinds. There's book. There are different kinds of near retinoscopy. But the key with any of them is, are you able to do it in a way that you notice the changes in, for example, the retinoscopic reflex? And are you comfortable then with appreciating that perhaps that's the best lens for near? You know, it, it always interests me that, um, that people talk about eyesight and say, well, I have 20-20 vision and it's perfect. Or they say, well, this child passed a school screening, you know, they're 20-20, never mind the discussion about how that's not an eye exam um, or, or a vision exam. But aside from that, you know, all these people are out there talking about how everybody sees 20 feet away. And I wanna know how many of us ever look 20 feet away in the course of our day. You know, my exam room's only 10 or 12 feet. My vision therapy room is only, I don't know, 12 or 15 feet. I, you know, I, I've never, I, I don't really look that far much of the time. And when I do, it's not at, at a lot of detail. You know, I'm not just like the letter chart that I put up. That's not what I'm mostly looking at. If I'm out driving, maybe a, a street sign or a road sign. But other than that, you know, we spend all this time refining a prescription for a place in space where we're going to do the least amount of our work. And we should spend at least as much time, if not more, refining a prescription that's appropriate for where we're gonna spend most of our day, which is generally within arm's reach. Not completely, but that's where we spend a lot of our time. And that's where the stress is greater often. So it always, it always um, kind of astounds me that we talk about this metric that's not maybe unimportant and it's useful, but it, it doesn't really relate to what most of us do all day long. And so how do we do just as good a job? How do we do essentially a near refraction like you do a distance refraction? And that's exactly what I do. Near retinoscopy is one way to look at that. Um, fuse cross cylinder at near is another way, NRA, PRA. I mean, there's, there's different tests that you can look at balance it near and I think that's really important and I would suggest that probably less than half of the optometrists out there take even a few minutes to look at that and feel comfortable uh, understanding what that means and how they can better prescribe for the person's needs and and I don't I just think we we need to emphasize it all the way from optometry school on out that it doesn't take very long I always say that you know, I understand everyone's busy and many people are working under uh, third party plans that don't really compensate them well for the kind of time that they might want to spend with a patient. But I had a general practice for 15 years and, you know, I did a few of these tests on everyone. It doesn't take very long to do a cover test, a near point of convergence, some pursuits and saccades. And then when you have them in the foropter, maybe to do um, a Fourier. And, and a virgins and a fused cross cylinder and an NRA PRA at near. 
especially because many of those, the patients you're doing it with, they're younger or even if they're adults, you know, they're, they're quick and they can respond uh, pretty easily. And it, it just adds a couple of minutes to the exam. And it really is a, it's a win-win. You know, it's a win for the patient when they get the right thing. And for those practices that dispense, you know, I, I worked in, um, uh, when I had my general practice, I dispensed eyewear. But before that, I worked for some doctors who, um, you know, who, who had the dispensing side. I wasn't part of that. And um, they actually dispensed a lot more eyewear because I was prescribing a lot of near near point prescriptions for patients that otherwise would have gone away without anything. And so it was a win for the patient and a win for the practice. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point, especially lately. I mean, low plus, you know, I, I got parents coming in every day saying my kids are looking at the computer all day long. What, you know, do something. <laughs> and that's what right. I grabbed and, the plus the 50s. Question, why do they want you to do something? Is the child complaining they can't see afterward? Are they rubbing their eyes? Are they uncomfortable? Are they just saying I can't, you know, do this anymore? And, you know, some of his children should get up and move. They shouldn't be sitting all the time. But a lot of it is that we as human beings were, are not well designed to do near centered work over a period of time. It doesn't mean that we can't do it. I think, um, I think it was Dr. Skeffington who said that, you know, all this near work is, um, you know, is uh, something that is biologically, uh, you know, it's a demand, but it's biologically unacceptable. It's not something that we, it's socially compulsive and biologically unacceptable. We're not, take a look at our systems. You know, if you look at galvanic skin response, if you look at other kinds of stress responses, you'll find that if someone does near centered work, you know, for more than maybe a few minutes, there are uh, markers that go up in terms of stress on the system because that's not, you know, we used to be hunters and gatherers, not readers and writers. <laughs>